Hello again everyone, welcome back to Timeless Testimonies. Today we're going to start into a series of videos that I'm going to be doing on Volume 5 of the Testimonies for the Church. And I may be doing a little bit of jumping around, but for the most part, my intention is to take us chronologically through the volume. Um, I know I've already done a playlist from Volume 5 going through a testimony called The Nature and Influence of the Testimonies. Be sure and check that out if you haven't already. Something that I think will be really important to keep in mind when going through the testimonies videos is why the testimonies were written in the first place. What is the purpose of these testimonies? Um, I have a couple other videos, well one of them is in the playlist on the nature and influence of the testimonies, but then there's another independent video that I had made prior to going through that playlist um, called The Object of Personal Testimonies, and that's another good one to review as well. Having the right um, purpose in mind, I guess, is the best way of putting it. The right purpose in mind when we're going through the testimonies for the church will really enable you to benefit the most from them because, you know, it's not really automatic for us to want to be self reflective or, I mean, some people it's easier for than others, but to really examine ourselves and to question our motives and to, um, kind of ask these harder questions as to how are we interacting with others? Are we being loving? Are we being honest with ourselves? Are we um, listening to the instructions from God? Are we wanting to apply the principles of truth and love in our own lives? Or are we typically more inclined to kind of look outside of ourselves, look at the other person? You know, it's tends to be easier to see where other people might be struggling or where they have a fault or whatever. But, you know, Jesus counseled us to try to get the beam out of our own eye before we go attempting to get a little speck out of someone else's eye. And there's wonderful lessons there. Um, the testimonies for the church have been an incredible blessing for me and I really value the, um, the changes that take place after really examining what Ellen White wrote and how she counseled us to think and how to, you know, view one another and treat one another. Doing that, examining that, and then really trying to put it into practice. You know, in John 17, Jesus had an intensely earnest prayer to his Father. That prayer was for the unity of his followers, of, of the believers in Christ, in the Messiah. And his appeal to his Father was that we would be one, that we would be united with him, with one another and with him, just as he was one with his father, just as he was united, right? So in order for that to happen, volume five has a lot to say about that unity. And some of the other volumes do too. They, they have a bit to say about it, but I noticed in reading volume five that it's very concentrated on the theme of unity and how to achieve that unity. So I'm really looking forward to going through this volume with you and I hope that you take the time to review, even if you've watched them before, take the time to review the purpose of the testimonies, what their object is, the nature and influence of the testimonies and all of that so that as we go through the testimonies for the church that we can benefit the most from it. So what I think I'll do is I'm going to actually read through and discuss a bit about the introduction to Volume 5. It's what the publishers wrote and they call it the Times of Volume 5. So there's the Times of Volume 1, the Times of Volume 2, Volume 3, Volume 4, etc. And it's basically just kind of giving a real quick overview of what was happening during the times that those volumes were written. So let's just get right into it. 
A little less than a decade is spanned by testimonies numbers 31 to 33, which comprise volume 5. The first was published in 1882, but includes messages given in 1881 and onward. Number 32 was published in 1885, and number 33 came from the press in 1889. That same year, the three were united in one book, Volume 5. Okay, so right away, many of you may have noticed, oh, okay, so Volume 5 was written during the time of the famous uh, General Conference meeting in Minneapolis in 1888. So we are in for a lot of very interesting material in Volume 5. This was an intensely interesting period in the rapidly developing work of Seventh-day Adventists. In North America, two new advanced schools were started in the year 1882, one at South Lancaster, Massachusetts, and the other at Heldsburg, California. Thus, from our denominational center at Battle Creek, the educational work was beginning to reach out toward the ends of the earth. Ten years earlier, our first school had been opened at Battle Creek, and two years later, its new buildings had been dedicated. During these ten years, many problems incident to the pioneering of this new and important line of endeavor were met. Sometimes the issues were large, and in not a few instances, special counsel was given through the spirit of prophecy to guide and guard this work. These messages dealing with problems from discipline to curriculum form a part of this book. So a part of this book, volume five, deals with counsels and messages given to deal with um, problems from anywhere from discipline to curriculum. And another thing that I want to mention is that here they say that um, counsel was given through the spirit of prophecy. Now that raises a really interesting question. What is the spirit of prophecy? Because having been raised as a Seventh-day Adventist, I was under the impression that the spirit of prophecy was just whatever Ellen White wrote. And maybe many of you share that idea. I think it's worth really asking the question, what is the spirit of prophecy? Is it just writings that Ellen White wrote? And I just finished publishing a series on that very subject. It's titled, What is the Spirit of Prophecy? It's a whole playlist. And there's several videos, you know, with different titles, of course, but be sure and check out that playlist. It starts off with just going through examples of the spirit of prophecy mentioned in the Old and the New Testaments in the Bible, and then it discusses um, or it shares some excerpts and sometimes complete articles that were written by some of the Adventist pioneers. Um, they include R.F. Cartrell, J.N. Andrews, Stephen Haskell, James White, Ellen White, uh, and some others. And it's very, very enlightening. I highly recommend going through that. And of course, Ellen White has a bit more to say about that topic right in this volume of the testimonies as well. But that's a great place to start in that playlist. The nine year period of this volume was also a time of extensive writing and publishing on the part of Ellen White. In 1882, arrangements were made to reprint a sketch of the Christian experience and views of Ellen G. White and Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1. The same year, these two books were united in one volume and entitled Early Writings. To meet the constant demand for the testimonies, the first 30 numbers were reprinted in 1885 in four books, Volumes 1 to 4, as they appear today. Now I'll pause there for just a second because when I read that, you know, I was reviewing after having finished the entire volume and I, I read that part in the introduction and I kind of stopped and I thought, you know, is that true? Because I like to try to question things as much as possible rather than just kind of taking things for granted. And if something agrees with what I've already thought, it's really easy to be like, you know, to be in agreement and to just believe it without questioning anything. But 
I really think there's a lot of value in revisiting our beliefs and questioning them and testing them to see, can we defend our positions? Are we believing what's actually true? Ellen White has a lot to say about how, you know, we shouldn't think that all of our expositions of scripture are without an error. We should be ever learning, ever coming uh, to better understand things and settling into the truth more and more and, and all these different things. So, you know, I've been wrong about things in the past. Probably every one of you watching has discovered things in their life that you once thought was true and then you learned, oh, actually that's not true. So how many more things like that might we be believing? Whatever topic it may be, it could be in all areas of life, but with anything, if there's an opportunity to question, now, is that true or um, am I understanding what a person is actually trying to convey? Am I understanding what they're saying correctly? It's a wonderful exercise to engage in and if you are believing true things, it'll only help you to understand why they're true and then you can share those reasons with others. And if you come to find out, oh, maybe there's been some things that I've been believing that actually aren't true, or maybe I'm just misunderstanding a little bit or something like that, man, you know, don't you wanna just believe true things? I mean, I don't think anybody wants to believe false things, maybe, Maybe there's some occasions where a person might for like fear or self-preservation, but even that I think is a misunderstanding because scripture tells us that the truth will set us free. You know, those are Jesus' words that you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free, right? So I've really contemplated that a lot over the past few years. How many things have I believed that weren't true and I just don't want to do that anymore. I only want to believe true things. So when I read that, it wasn't really ringing true to me because I had just read some things that Ellen White had written in volume five that didn't seem to me like that was um, accurately representing. I'm not saying that they weren't in high demand, that the testimonies weren't in high demand, but I just want to share with you something really interesting. So during the time that these volumes were compiled into, you know, the four volumes as we have them today. So the first 30 numbers of the testimonies, they say in 1885 were compiled into the, um, the volumes one through four as we have them today because of the constant demand. But if you turn to, I think it's page 217. I lost my spot. Yes, page 217 of volume five, there's a testimony called An Appeal. And it was actually originally written um, to be read at a general, no, a camp meeting. Yeah, she was supposed to be read um, at a camp meeting in 1882. I'm looking at my computer here for some little notes there. But anyway, so it was read at that camp meeting, but then they included it in volume five because it was written during the times of volume five. But anyway, just here's a couple things I'll read from the first couple paragraphs. I'm filled with sadness when I think of our condition as a people. The Lord has not closed heaven to us, but our own course of continual backsliding has separated us from God. Pride, covetousness, and love of the world have lived in the heart without fear of banishment or condemnation. Grievous and presumptuous sins have dwelt among us, and yet the general opinion is that the church is flourishing and that peace and spiritual prosperity are in all her borders. The church has turned back from following Christ, her leader, and is steadily retreating toward Egypt. Yet few are alarmed or astonished at their want of spiritual power. Doubt and even disbelief of the testimonies of the Spirit of God is leavening our churches everywhere. Satan would have it thus. Ministers who preach self instead of Christ would have it thus. The testimonies are unread and unappreciated. God has spoken to you 
Light has been shining from his word and from the testimonies, and both have been slighted and disregarded. The result is apparent in the lack of purity and devotion and earnest faith among us. Now, obviously the testimonies for the church were predominantly counsel and reproof and warning. So, you know, when going through these, they there might be a tendency to be tempted to view it as kind of like, oh, a downer or a negative or whatever. But we are told that those whom God loves, he rebukes and chastens because when he sees us going down a dangerous path and believing wrong things or behaving in unloving ways, ways that are harmful to ourselves and to others, the only loving thing to do is to bring it to our attention and to correct us and that sort of thing. So I remembered Ellen White saying that the testimonies were unread and unappreciated and that just didn't quite jive with the statement that they, because of the constant demand for the testimonies. So again, you know, I'm not saying that people weren't reading the testimonies and that people weren't benefiting from them, but I do want to be careful in promoting some kind of idea that at any point in our church's history, that there has been generally a, a welcoming of the reproof or um, an interest in having our wrongs pointed out to us, that sort of thing. I mean, if you take the time to read the testimonies for the church, that is not the picture that's painted by Ellen White, the author of the testimonies. So I think it's really important to not get lulled into some kind of rosy colored view of how people were receiving correction in the days that they were actually having them written by Ellen White to individuals and to groups. And one of the reasons I think that's important is because then we will be more cautious, I hope, in how we interact with what we are reading in the testimonies because we'll take it very seriously. At least that is my hope. So back to the Times of Volume 5. I'll pick up where I left off in the middle of that paragraph. So just to back up a little bit for the context, to meet the constant demand for the testimonies, the first 30 numbers were reprinted in 1885 in four books, volumes one to four, as they appear today. Sketches from the Life of Paul, the forerunner of the Acts of the Apostles, was published in 1883. In 1884, Mrs. White completed her work on Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, The Great Controversy, and it was published immediately. It soon found its way through Cole Porter channels to many thousands of homes, and ten editions were rolled from the presses in three short years of time. In 1888, The Enlarged Great Controversy, the book we know so well today, was published, taking the place of the earlier, briefer volume. At the denominational headquarters in Battle Creek, there was a steady growth. New equipment was added in the publishing house. The sanitarium and the college were greatly prospered and continued to grow. These developments brought large numbers of Seventh-day Adventists to that city. The hazards of so many Adventists gathering in one center with the inevitable tendency to a feeling of less responsibility and toward lower standards is pointed out in the early part of this volume. These institutional developments were also fraught with the danger that the work would become mechanical and lose its initial simplicity. Such dangers appeared especially in the publishing house. The testimonies of this volume stress economy, industry, alertness, and furnish managers and foremen with guiding instruction for their tasks. At the same time, while problems of long-established work were being met at our headquarters, out in the Pacific Northwest, new fields were being developed, and many were accepting the message. With the opening of these frontier regions, there were many new problems. Ellen White herself made two visits to the Northwest and, in connection with the last trip, wrote much counsel to those who were laboring there, 
counsel on practical subjects vital to the welfare of the work and the ministers who were working among the sturdy, independent-minded men and women who had pushed westward and established their homes in these vast, newly opened regions. These were men and women of energy, daring, rugged individuality, and many were persons of deep conviction who accepted the call of the Advent message. These vigorous pioneers needed the strong, molding influence of the Spirit of God in the development of Christian character. They needed warnings against the love of money and worldly ambitions. And I'll say we're just as much in need of those same counsels today. I mean, that's one of the reasons why God moved upon Ellen White to write these down so that they would be preserved for generations to come if time should last that long. To the ministry were sent earnest counsels pointing out the danger that their messages might be shaped by the opinions of strong-minded church members. Counsel was given to guard against carelessness in the erection of church edifices, as seen in some instances. Warnings were also given against lightly regarding pledges of gifts to God's cause. All these and other councils dealing with many of the problems connected with the work in these new territories occupy a prominent place in this volume. The eyes of Seventh-day Adventists were being turned more and more to the world field. For a decade, we had been carrying on work in Europe. Now, in 1885, Elders S. N. Haskell and J. O. Corliss, with a company of workers, were sent to Australia to open up work in that southern continent. Africa was entered two years later by Elders D. A. Robinson and C. L. Boyd. And the message was carried to Hong Kong that same year by a layman, Brother Abraham LaRue. Then in 1889, coal porters commenced their work in South America. Even Mrs. White was called overseas, leaving for Europe in 1885. There she spent two and a half years traveling, counseling, speaking, and writing. In June 1887, at Moss, Norway, she attended the first Seventh-day Adventist camp meeting held outside the United States. Her ministry overseas was much appreciated. There was also, during the time represented by Volume 5, considerable opposition on the part of a small group of disaffected souls who years earlier had left our ranks. Their attacks were leveled primarily against the agent of the prophetic gift and her writings, which have strengthened and built up the church through the years. A real quick um, interjection there. Kind of a shout back to the What is the Spirit of Prophecy playlist that I have on the channel and how I really do agree with the way this is phrased here by the committee who put together the introduction on the Times of Volume 5 that Ellen White was the agent of the prophetic gift. So we'll continue on. Also during the decade of this volume, one of our leading evangelists lost his way and was soon actively engaged in tearing down a work he had formerly labored to establish. Two communications written by Ellen White to restrain this man from the plunge he was about to take are found in this book. One commences on page 571 and the other on page 621. And of course, once we get to those testimonies, it'll be um, important to kind of take note and we'll dig into those a bit deeper at the time when we get there. The attempt to save him was fruitless and he turned in bitter tirade on Mrs. White and the prophetic gift. While such attacks, of course, did not deter the work of Seventh-day Adventists, it is clear that they were recognized as distracting elements that should be counteracted. And I will say that the same tactics are employed by the devil today. Anything he can do to try to tear down the work of the spirit of prophecy, he will do. But, praise God, it is his work and he is able to carry it through. Although it is still a reality, a sad reality, 
that not everyone will cooperate with that and real losses will be felt because of the interference and the hindrance to the work of the spirit of prophecy. That's all the more convicting to be sure that we are in right standing with God's counsel and that we are only believing true things because then, you know, if we're only believing true things, or at least if we have a desire to only believe true things, we still may have misconceptions that have to be corrected along the way. But if the willingness and the desire is there for us to learn, to be learners in the school of Christ, then God can really work with us and he can correct these false ideas that we may be holding on to and that we can learn the many lessons that he has for us to learn and unlearn the many, many lessons that are there for us to unlearn. It is not strange then that several vital articles touching on the prophetic gift were penned during this time. One of these forms the basis of the introduction to the Great Controversy, 1888 edition. At some point during the series of Volume 5, I think it'll be great for us to take a closer look at that introduction to the Great Controversy that was just mentioned here. Others are found in this volume. It was at this time, too, that Mrs. White gathered from all the published testimonies that which she had written on the nature and influence of the testimonies for the church and compiled them into a 38-page article found near the close of this volume. And again, I'll just refer you to the series of videos that I have already done on that testimony, the nature and influence of the testimonies. In the fall of 1888, an important general conference session was held in Minneapolis, Minnesota. At this meeting, there came to those assembled a broader, fuller conception of the great truths of righteousness by faith. The failure of some to open their hearts to the light which was their cause to shine so brightly spurred Mrs. White to lead out in an encouragement to diligent Bible study and to break down the barriers to advancement in the perception of truth. Again, there's that theme of advancing in truth. At the general conference session the next year, 1889, workers and laity alike reported in their social meetings that the past year had been the best of their life. The light shining forth from the word of God had been clear and distinct. Justification by faith, Christ our righteousness, the universal testimony from those who have spoken has been that this message of light and truth, which has come to our people, is just the truth for this time. And wherever they go among the churches, light and relief and the blessing of God are sure to come in. E.G. White, Manuscript 10, 1889, quoted in The Fruitage of Spiritual Gifts, page 234. God's message to his people turned into a glorious victory, the tide which threatened defeat. As the writing of this volume was being brought to a close, a crisis threatened in the United States in the form of a proposed national Sunday law. In this connection, there was brought before Mrs. White the views of the impending conflict and the issues which the church must meet as apostate Protestantism unites with Catholicism to enforce oppressive measures. The pathetic lethargy of those who understood the issues was clearly portrayed, and there was a call to action. Now again, let's keep in mind, let's, let's be ready as we delve further into this volume of the Testimonies for the Church to be very much in the spirit of self-examination. Are we also guilty of that pathetic lethargy? What are we doing? Are we actively seeking to hasten the second coming of Christ? We're going to be talking a lot more about that in upcoming videos. In Volume 5, there is a greater diversity of subjects than in any other of the nine volumes of the Testimonies. 
This was the last of the group of testimony volumes to contain personal testimonies addressed to various individuals. A period of 11 years was to elapse before the issuance of Volume 6 of Testimony Writings. This volume is of great value to the Church today because of the practical nature of its timely warnings and counsels. Stressed all through it are solemn statements pointing out the nearness of the end and the preparation which is needed in the light of the impending conflict. Ministers are called to deeper consecration. Executives are admonished. Physicians are counseled. Teachers are warned against adopting worldly principles and are encouraged to guide their students into soul-winning services. Cole Porter evangelists are urged to higher standards of qualification. Parents are given instruction regarding home life and child training. Those with so-called new light, but with a message contrary to the fundamentals of doctrine, are reproved. The rank and file of the people are called to a revival and reformation. The instruction and warnings of this volume exerted a steadying, sobering influence upon Seventh-day Adventists as they were launching out into greater lines of endeavor. They exert the same influence today. And I will just end by saying that will be true for each and every one of us if and only if we apply the counsel to our practical lives, if we put into practice the counsel given, if we allow the Holy Spirit to correct us, to show us our wrongs, to show us where we are holding on to false ways of thinking, false ways of believing, false ideas, and to allow the Holy Spirit to give us the truth in place of our error, wherever that may be, that we are believing error. and that we will be willing to come into unity with one another and with God because as we come into harmony with truth, if we are all in harmony with truth, that is the only way true unity can be brought about. And the gift of prophecy, the gifts of the Spirit are given to us for the purpose of bringing about Christian unity. So I'm excited to be getting into Volume 5. Thank you for studying the Testimonies for the Church, and I pray that you're very blessed. Shalom.